Welcome to all the participants joining this webinar. As all of you are aware, India and Mauritius signed a tax treaty protocol on 10th of May amending the India-Mauritius tax treaty. There is one big positive and one big negative in the protocol which has been signed. The big negative is that from 1st of April 2017, India will have the right to tax capital gains on transfer of shares by Mauritius companies. And the one big positive is Mauritius has managed to negotiate a lower interest withholding tax rate of 7.5% with India in the protocol. This means that Mauritius, which has always been a preferred jurisdiction for making equity investments into India, will now be a preferred jurisdiction for making debt investments into India. This is a significant development in the history of taxation in India given the fact that more than 50% of foreign investment in India comes through Mauritius and Singapore. And why Singapore is relevant for our discussions today is because India Mauritius and India Singapore tax treaty are linked. And with this amendment, even the India Singapore tax treaty gets amended to take away capital gains tax exemption benefit for Singapore companies. This webinar is very timely given the fact that the protocol which was signed has just got released few hours back and the interesting thing is that we now have the full text of the protocol and we can discuss all the changes in detail which changes were not available earlier. Before we delve deep into the changes in the protocol, it is important to understand the history of India Mauritius Tax Treaty. The India Mauritius Tax Treaty was signed in 1984 and interestingly what had happened at that time was India had negotiated a capital gains tax exemption article with Mauritius on the assumption that the Indian companies in future are going to avail of the exemption when they sell shares of Mauritius companies. And this article was made mutual by Mauritius at that time. Interestingly, what happened was from 1984 to 1991, there was hardly any Mauritius company which invested into India, given the fact that India was a closed economy till 1991. But what happened in 1991 was when India opened up its economy for foreign investment, there were a number of foreign investors who wanted to invest into India and majority of them were US investors and the problem that they were facing was that when they invested directly into India there was an issue of double taxation. So what happened was when US investors invested into India there was a capital gains tax in India and there was a capital gains tax in the US and because of the way the sole rules work in both the countries there was no tax credit that was available in the US for the capital gains tax paid in India. So this resulted in a situation where there was double taxation on the same income and which is why Mauritius was interposed between US and India to ensure that there is only one level of taxation in the US with India and Mauritius not taxing that income. What happened was this became a trend and uh, Mauritius became a preferred jurisdiction for equity investments into India and uh, there have been number of cases uh, uh, from the tax department side and uh, uh, the most important one being the Azadi Bachao Andolan case of Supreme Court in 2004 uh, with the latest one being the Punjab and Haryana High Court judgment on uh, Blackstone Sarko deal where the courts have blessed the India Mauritius tax treaty. This is something which has been haunting the Indian government for the past 25 years and finally the Indian government managed to renegotiate the treaty to take away the capital gains tax exemption benefits by Mauritius companies. However, at the same time as a trade-off for giving up the capital gains tax exemption benefits on transfer of shares, Mauritius managed to negotiate a lower withholding tax rate of 7.5% on interest which is going to be a big boost for making Mauritius a preferred jurisdiction for making debt investments into India. Uh, with this, I would like to 
uh, uh, invite Nishit to comment on this. Uh, uh, and Nishit uh, has been instrumental in developing Mauritius as an offshore financial services center. And uh, Nishit, it will be good to hear from you your thoughts on the changes in the treaty. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, appreciate your uh, short summary. And uh, I'm right now in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley. Uh, and I would like to greet everybody good evening on this side of the world and good morning on the Eastern Hemisphere side. Uh, as you all know, Mauritius Treaty has been in existence since 1983. And uh, over a period of time, you know, it has played a very critical role in attracting investment in India. As all of you know, in 1984, the uh, tax rates in India were pretty high. Capital gains tax were being taxed very low, almost 25 percent, maybe long term, short term, maybe as good as maybe 50 percent, or maybe more than that. And uh, it was very, very you know difficult environment at that point of time. And right from uh, you know when India opened up in 1991, you remember June 21st uh, was the uh, real D day. On that day, India opened up to foreign investment, and after that you know, foreign investment became easier uh, to come in. But one of the major issues was taxation and particularly the tax system between India and the U.S. Now, at that point of time, uh, the uh, tax environment not being so friendly and little confiscatory in many ways, um, Mauritius really played an important role. And uh, uh, it facilitated investment because the way in which the source rules applied on capital gains tax in the uh, US were completely opposite to the way in which they applied in India. As a result, there was a major problem on tax credit in the US on the foreign capital gains tax uh, that was enforced. And um, it was with that view in mind, you know, uh, when I looked at the situation. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to Mauritius and work with the government of Mauritius to develop offshore center. But the, uh, the most important thing that was brought in mind by Mauritius government was to develop itself as a robust, transparent offshore financial center where exchange of information, uh, there was no hesitation, any information or any KYC norms, so made the strictest in the world. And some people said it was pain in the neck, but at the same time, you know, those KYC jobs even today uh, has made it, you know, that it has not become a center for money laundering or, uh, you know, round tripping, you know, uh, hardly any case has come out. And at any point of time, anything in, um, uh, happened, the Mauritius government has been a lot more cooperative uh, to the Indian tax department. In fact, the Indian tax department has been able to position or place its own people in Mauritius as well, which is not always uh, possible uh, in other countries. So Mauritius has been most cooperative as far as uh, exchange of information is concerned. The result is very transparent. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, so here, in fact, uh, Hillary Clinton once said it was the best fine offshore financial center um, in Africa. So given all those things, what happened was that uh, Mauritius became very, very popular. Uh, as you all know, India affected a lot of investment. Mauritius facilitated a huge amount of investment um, overcoming the uh, tax regime in India. And um, uh, it, uh, what happened, other thing, uh, was that the Mauritius also became uh, a fund center because it, it, its focus was more on the institutional the investors. And therefore, uh, that also brought a good reputation to Mauritius. And uh, therefore, initial investments, the so first five companies that were set up, and, uh, they were all funds and they participated there. So, and on the other hand, the Indian government also was instrumental in promoting Mauritius around. Um, although some tax cases aside, by and large, Indian government was extremely supportive uh, of the treaty. And in good faith, we always implemented the treaty. It was instrumental, as I said, in promoting the Mauritius route. And um, it, it, for all of you remember, Indian government vehemently defended the Mauritius route before the Supreme Court 
in as a defensive on the land case. Besides, it seems circular to ensure that the credit benefits or capital gains were provided to Mauritius companies. Uh, number two, it uh, may be recalled that during the 90s, you know, when the treaty was first started to be extensively used, capital gains tax rates in India were significantly higher than today, as I mentioned earlier. And especially investors from US, where from most of the investment comes, you know, they were concerned, uh, you know, on, um, on, the, on, the, on the tax credit mechanism. And tax credit was a huge issue in the US as well. So Mauritius again became a facilitator for uh, getting investment into India. Much of the investment, especially from tax exempt investors in the US and other ones, would not have possibly easily come to India because post tax returns would have been um, made a problem in addition to sometimes the exchange uh, rate hit that the investors take. So, you know, with the, uh, but what has happened now that the time of high taxation is now slowly disappearing in India. And this year, as you know, Indian tax rates or capital gains have been brought down to a level of uh, to, 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 um, uh, 10% level and in some cases, you know, uh, completely tax exempt, uh, especially in the case of listed companies. Uh, so, uh, uh, as we know that now the tax regime has become more relaxed, much better, uh, and therefore, uh, when the times are not so good, Mauritius really came handy. And um, uh, th therefore, uh, it has played an important role. So both countries have done a good job overall. It's almost now 30, um, 35, 36 years, uh, or at least 33 years of the treaty. And um, obviously, it was expected that the uh, changes would come for last 10 years everybody expected that the changes would were in our things and other things. So it it, it has not caught people by surprise uh, and um, uh, the people were uh, already mentally ready for some changes and everybody planned accordingly. As in especially last five, seven years, there was more focus on substance or form, even though it was strictly not required in the context of Mauritius. And um, so but everybody focused on that and um, uh, made structuring a little more robust. So that was the thing. And um, now, uh, 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 one interesting thing that I uh, look at uh, in this whole way in which the protocol has been worked on, uh, you know, in fairness, we must complement, uh, we must complement both the governments on uh, phasing out this capital gains tax regime, you know, uh, which gives exemption to the uh, Mauritius uh, companies um, in a very, very orderly manner, by and large. Always there will be a few issues around here and there, but uh, on the whole, the grandfathering of the investments made prior to 2017, first of April, and giving for the, uh, for the concessional tax treatment of 50% of capital gain, that would be about, say, 5%. And then filling out itself shows that uh, both governments have uh, acted more responsibly, and uh, to that extent, uh, you know, we have to give some uh, credit. And um, other thing is that um, as um, as uh, uh, as a concession to other things, uh, so far we were in the age of equity investments last 20 years or uh, 25 years. But now India is likely to usher into a debt market. Our markets are debt markets are not deep. We need to involve them. And the tax rate of seven point five percent that has been provided um, on the interest will also be very helpful in um, developing our uh, you know uh, debt uh, markets in India. So those are some of the things, and um, uh, it, it is very very helpful to um, use this treaty uh, in, a, in, a, in a proper manner because all countries are also now bringing what are called anti-abuse rules. So structuring and architecture of the investors and investors with investment vehicles would have to be looked at very carefully. 
And um, other the thing is that um, uh, exchange controls in India are getting relaxed to attract a foreign debt, both in dollar terms as well as in rupee terms. So there are already efforts on the way. In many ways, therefore, as far as Mauritius is concerned, it uh, would become even more attractive than the current Singapore, Cyprus, Netherlands regime for the interest of uh, um, uh, And, uh, you know, so this is how we see the scenario emerging. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, other important thing is that Pinos, I think this is where there are some issues that I believe as we go along, Rajesh Makkali, who is the head of the international tax team, would explain what are the issues in Pinos. And uh, one of the things that has happened for FPIs and FIs in India is that uh, the regular trading of shares of business, uh, uh, which would normally be characterized as a business income, has been artificially characterized as capital gains in India. I think this is unfair. You must give natural meaning to the uh, terms and uh, the effect to that under the tax laws. I think more artificiality in the tax law, more complications, more problems, and more um, you know management issues as well. So I think we should uh, look to revisit uh, the FPA regime as far as the characterization of the gains is concerned. And number two, that uh, you know. The, 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 the taxation of uh, the P-notes itself, you know, there are some issues, so that would be discussed as you go along. And um, I, I think that, that that is something we, if again, I know those, uh, you know, crises, we have uh, much uh, better things to go. Ecosystem for business is improving in India. Ease of doing business in India is now picking off uh, at, at better shape. The startup ecosystem again is uh, again, as uh, I think developed now, so I think we, we, while we have some way to go, but looks to me that this uh, uh, whole renegotiation of the protocol should be taken in proper spirit and um, move forward, and uh, one must and celebrate that we enjoyed the pretty benefits for over 33 years. And with those words, I would like to uh, ask Mr. to take the reins back of this webinar and walk you through more uh, specific provisions of the protocol. I believe pro protocol has just been, actual protocol has just been released and uh, they have already had a look at it and uh, I'm sure you will enjoy the rest of the conversation today. Thank you so much. Over to you, Nishal. Thanks, uh, Nishal. Uh, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the press release was uh, uh, issued on 10th of May and uh, the actual protocol has just been released few hours back. Uh, so, Mansi, uh, is there any change in the protocol versus what was given in the press release and would you like to run through the specific changes uh, which have been captured in the protocol? Sure, Nisha. Thank you. Uh, actually, the protocol has been webinar or previous session of this webinar about 13 hours ago, what has changed is basically now we have the text of the protocol. So we have a little bit more clarity since then, although most of the changes uh, were in line with what we'd anticipated. Of course, the press release um, had, referred, had referred only to interest withholding rates with respect to banks, the 7.5 that has been mentioned by Michelle and Nishit both. Uh, but as we, when we look closely at the protocol, it actually talks about um, all interest income that will be paid to even non-bank entities. So this is actually a very significant improvement from what the debt position was as far as Mauritius was concerned, but we'll come to that in more detail. Now just uh, talking about the protocol and the changes that I put forth, the protocol has proposed or revised the treaty on about seven to eight towns. There have been some new articles proposed and some of the old articles have been revised uh, uh, to some extent. Now, some of the changes, for example, some of the smaller changes or um, other changes relate to, for example, strengthening the exchange of information clause between the two countries. Or there's a new article that has been uh, introduced as far as uh, collection of taxes and how the two countries will assist each other is concerned. There's also provisions about fees for technical services. 
and how other income will be taxed. Um, they have also introduced the concept of a service PE, which is uh, similar to what we already have with the in, under the India US Treaty, which basically says if you are rendering services beyond a certain date threshold, then you could be taxable in India. But if we look at all the changes, as uh, you've also mentioned, Mr. Previously, one of the most significant changes is that which relates to capital gains, as far as investment structures are concerned. And this is even more relevant given the, given the demon fiction that Nisha talked about, that not only is this relevant for PE or VC investors, even FIIs are deemed to earn capital gains as far as shares or uh, you know, income from securities are concerned. So it becomes, any change to this clause becomes extremely relevant. But before I get into what uh, the change has been proposed and more details on that, maybe a quick recap, recap on what the current position is. So if we look at it, generally speaking, a foreign investor will not be taxable in India unless it has Indian source income. When it comes down to capital gains, the way our laws are actually, the Indian laws are drafted, it basically provides that capital gains for transfer of Indian property will be taxable in India. So purely looking at domestic law, if a foreign investor transfer Indian company shares, they have exposure in India. But this is where the treaties come into play. And particularly talking about India Mauritius tax treaty, how it currently reads, gains from alienation of any property uh, of the shares in an Indian company would be taxable in the state where the transferor is located. So putting it in context, today for Mauritius investor transfer shares of an Indian company, um, any gains would be taxable in Mauritius and India does not have the right to tax it. Now this exact position is what has been subject to a lot of debate and discussion and has been often litigated. We've been in the court arguing in favor of the Mauritius uh, Treaty time and again. And the courts have repeatedly held that until now, since the treaty doesn't have a limitation of benefit clause, as long as the Mauritius investor has a tax residency certificate, it will be able to avail the benefits under the treaty. It is this exact clause or the article in the treaty that is being changed by the protocol. So now what going forward what will be provided is that capital gains earned from transfer of shares of Indian company will be taxable in India. So Mauritius has lost his right to tax that and India has gained the right to tax such gains. Of course, uh, something to note here is that this just specifically refers to alienation of shares. So the question arises what happens to other securities or debt investments that have been made and there's a strong argument to say that that will fall within the residuary clause which basically gives the right to the state where the transferor is located. In that sense, we will see a difference you can see a difference in terms of taxation of shares versus the rest of the security. Uh, what is also relevant is when this actually becomes applicable. And the, the, the capital gains clause will fall away effective from 1st April 2017. But the current investments are all grandfathered grandfathered, which basically means that as long as you invest prior to 1st April 2017, you can exit at any point in the future, those investments should be able to avail the benefits of the India Merchant Tax Treaty as they stand today. What happens post 1st April 2017? The way the protocol reads, there's a transitory period that has been provided. So for a period of two years from April 2017 to uh, 2019, there's a lower rate that is applicable to gains, which is 50% of the Indian tax rate. And actually, just on that, the Indian capital gains tax rate range from 0 to 40%. It would depend on long-term, short-term, listed, unlisted, etc. But that's the range that could apply to foreign investors. And what the uh, transitory period, during the transitory period, these rates will be reduced to 50%. But this whole transitory period, if you know, is only for two years. And it talks about the gains that are earned during these two years. So practically speaking, not only would you have to invest after 2017 and before 19, you'd also have to exit from that investment during this period in, or, in order to get that 50% tax rate. Now, I, the, as you may know, the holding period for long-term 
categorization for unlisted share itself is two years. So this might have limited utility as far as long-term gains are concerned and maybe more relevant for investors who are looking at short-term gains. Uh, post-2019, of course, the cap gains are going to be fully taxable in India. So that is as far as the cap gains are concerned. The other mention is with respect to interest which earlier, at least the press release had talked about it being only applicable to banks, but uh, based on a close look at the protocol, yeah, the reduced rate of 7.5% is actually applicable to all, even non-bank uh, Mauritius residents. So if an interest, so if a debt investment is made, then you can get a good uh, or a low interest withholding rate as compared to what the current law is, which, which could go as much as 40%. So I think, Mr. those are the main changes which the protocol has proposed. Sure. Thanks, Mansi. And uh, back to you. Thanks. Uh, so, Rajesh, uh, there are a lot of general partners who are on road for raising their India Focus Fund. And uh, there are many global funds uh, which also have Indian allocation. With this change in the treaty, do you think the choice of jurisdiction for routing investments into India is going to change? Um, initial, when you think about it uh, in terms of traditionally what are the sources um, of FDI, in terms of uh, uh, which are the countries people have always used uh, as far as investments uh, in uh, uh, securities in India are concerned. Uh, they usually broadly spread across four jurisdictions where India has a favorable uh, tax treaty benefit. Uh, Mauritius has been uh, probably the primary driver followed by uh, Singapore, Netherlands, and Cyprus, all of whom have s some kind of favorable benefit insofar as capital gains uh, are concerned. So coming back to when we start now looking at the changes and in terms of the jurisdictions uh, where uh, uh, people can actually look at investing in India from, Mauritius obviously now, at least when it comes to uh, equity securities, uh, come 1st of April 2017, the benefits effectively uh, uh, fall away, uh, though there is obviously the two-year window period which Mansi was talking about. The second jurisdiction which people have traditionally used has been uh, Singapore. Uh, one of the things is that when you start looking at the Singapore Treaty, the Singapore Treaty is inextricably linked to the Mauritius Treaty. What the Singapore Treaty actually provides is that in the event there is a change to the capital gains tax of the Mauritius uh, tax treaty to bring about a source-based taxation. In such situation, the benefit under the Singapore treaty also automatically falls away. So you end up effectively in a position where come 1st April 2017, the benefit even under the India-Singapore treaty effectively falls away. And, and in fact, one of the key things uh, today is that when you look at the protocol, uh, uh, the Singapore Treaty doesn't really have uh, any grandfathering or any provision because the way the Singapore Protocol reads uh, today is that if Mauritius, India Mauritius moves to a source-based taxation, the right of uh, uh, residence-based taxation under the Singapore Treaty falls away in entirety. So, which means unlike the Mauritius Treaty, which currently has grandfathering provisions, uh, which has been proposed or introduced in the protocol, in the Singapore Treaty today, there is no such uh, benefit that comes in. So, even if you have technically, even if you have invested today uh, in a Singapore company, uh, uh, in an Indian company through the Singapore route, and you're exiting post 1st April 2017, the gains, India will still obtain a right to tax those particular uh, capital gains. Having said that, uh, today uh, the government has also gone on record to say that they will go, go back and renegotiate the Singapore Treaty to put it on par with Mauritius, which effectively uh, would mean that uh, hopefully the Singapore Treaty will also have the grandfathering provision which will ensure that investments made uh, till such time uh, uh, the uh, 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 till 31st March or at least till date will obtain the benefit under the uh, India-Singapore Treaty as far as capital gains are concerned. Which takes me back to the two other jurisdictions which are sort of left um, uh, purely on uh, uh, equity investments. 
uh, one is Cyprus. Um, Cyprus, uh, the treaty today uh, has not yet been renegotiated. It will, uh, I think, uh, the idea is that it will eventually get renegotiated. But the problem with Cyprus is that uh, India has already notified um, Cyprus as uh, effectively a non-cooperative jurisdiction. Uh, this effectively implies that uh, any payments uh, which are made to a Cypriot resident is subject to a minimum withholding tax of 20% uh, irrespective of uh, what, is provi what is provided under the treaty. <coughs> so the 30 percent tax rate I'm sorry uh, in the in the uh, uh, under section 94a of the act uh, today it stands as an impediment as far as uh, use of Cyprus is concerned the matter is before uh, the Supreme Court uh, uh, today as we speak uh, to see whether uh, uh, the notification of Cyprus is valid or not but at this point in time pretty much since the time uh, it got notified uh, there's been hardly any uh, FDI investments which has been coming through from uh, Cyprus because of this issue. And that sort of takes me back to the last sort of, uh, 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 the last man standing, so to say, which is really Netherlands. Uh, Netherlands today enjoys um, what I would call a slightly more favorable regime for capital gains as compared to most other jurisdictions. Because the way the Netherlands treaty sort of works is that if you are having effectively a portfolio investment of less than 10 percent, the right to tax will effectively vest with Netherlands. If you are having an investment of more than 10 percent, if you are selling to a non-resident, in that case the right to tax will vest with Netherlands. However, if you are selling to an Indian resident, then the right to tax will shift back to, uh, to uh, India. So, so to a certain extent, uh, while Netherlands doesn't really offer you the same kind of benefits which a Mauritius or Singapore uh, 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 ha or used to or uh, has in the past, it still gives you enough alternatives as far as uh, potential investments are concerned. Um, and, and again, even when you are talking about um, uh, f fundraising or investments for India, you probably have to split it into the different classes of investors uh, who are looking at investing into India. On one hand, you have uh, private equity investors who are looking at uh, taking um, minority uh, positions in Indian companies. And uh, on the other hand, you also have uh, uh, foreign portfolio investors who effectively uh, look at listed securities <coughs> uh, insofar as trading in the Indian markets are concerned. And I think the approach that each one of them will take is, uh, will be slightly different. Uh, the third set of category is also foreign portfolio investors who, who uh, do uh, derivatives or, uh, or who issue uh, ODIs. But uh, I will have uh, my colleague Richie come back and discuss that in further detail. But when you look at the two broad classes of investors, uh, which are essentially the FDI investors or, um, uh, and the FII investors, I think the way people will approach the market may change slightly uh, because to a certain extent um, uh, one of the things is that since at least as far as um, uh, even unlisted securities are concerned the long term capital gains tax rate has come down to a uh, 10% rate uh, even as far as private companies are concerned uh, which just came out in this year's budget. You will <coughs> probably have a situation where people will start factoring this uh, as part of the valuation uh, even when they are looking at doing deals in India. Uh, unlike earlier a 20% tax rate, a 10% uh, tax rate is, is a bit more palatable so to say. Uh, so, so yes it is going to have an impact uh, saying that even while uh, uh, private equity investors are looking at alternate structures as far as investments into India, it is going to play a role in uh, as for on the valuation and the IRR return expectation uh, which they are going to have while they are investing in India. Uh, and, and yes, you are going to have uh, structures, uh, alternate structures develop. Uh, I think Netherlands is going to come up as a, a preferred uh, route uh, on equity investments. But, but I think uh, at least in the short run, I don't see how uh, in order to facilitate an investment, the only place that you can really work on is the valuation. As far as uh, FII investments are, uh, or uh, foreign portfolio investors are concerned, uh, two things. One is that uh, as far as the long only investors are concerned, uh, uh, I think for them it's a bit of a lesser issue because on long only funds in any event, um, um, 
your the gains that uh, uh, foreign portfolio investor is getting is effectively going to be in the nature of long term capital gains and since it's essentially a transaction on the floor of the stock exchange that by itself is exempt uh, from tax uh, under the indian domestic laws so th that's that's a category of investors who i think are going to be less bothered about uh, the changes in fact if you look at it historically you actually have a number of uh, uh, fpis uh, who are mostly looking at taking long only positions not really bother about treaty benefits just go in and directly trade even directly sometimes from the us or other jurisdictions purely because they have the comfort that in any event um, uh, there is a domestic law exemption uh, as far as uh, long term capital gains tax are concerned on short term capital on uh, uh, fii entities who are looking at having uh, uh, let's say trading positions in india uh, uh, for them it's going to be a bit of challenge because the 15% tax is going to be a significant uh, uh, tax uh, which is going to be there and i think they will be probably more looking at moving to uh, jurisdictions like netherlands you also have sweden as an alternative which we have seen in the past and which we've been doing in the past for uh, portfolio uh, investments uh, into india so i think it's going to be a bit of a mixed bag in terms of uh, how people uh, will end up approaching uh, on investments uh, and again uh, 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 today we are only talking about equity securities there are other kind of securities through which uh, you can invest in india uh, for which the treatment uh, 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 is not necessarily the same that we are talking about but i think we can talk about it a bit more detail now sure thanks rajesh uh, so interestingly as rajesh mentioned uh, the protocol only captures the capital gains tax exemption benefits uh, going away for mauritius entities in case of transfer of shares but what happens to other type of capital assets uh, like for example interest in an llp or for example transfer of debentures what happens to those type of uh, securities and uh, if uh, based on the protocol it's very clear it is only applicable to shares but uh, today in the uh, uh, in one of the leading business newspaper the revenue secretary has made a statement that all types of capital assets are going to be covered under the protocol uh, as far as capital gains tax exemption benefits uh, uh, are concerned and uh, that's where it becomes interesting since the protocol is very clear that other than shares uh, mauritius entities will still get the benefit of capital gains tax exemption and uh, uh, one of the uh, interesting structure which could be evaluated going forward by foreign investors is to invest in an llp in india or to set up an llp in india for conducting the business uh, because transfer of interest in an LLP is, has not been covered and as all of you are aware foreign investment in LLP has been permitted uh, by uh, the Indian government uh, uh, you know a couple of years back and uh, uh, the only restriction on foreign investment in the LLP is in situations where the sector in which the LLP is operating has certain performance link conditions and most of the sectors in India uh, do not uh, have performance link conditions. So this is one model which could be explored going forward to still uh, to con to still continue availing of the Mauritius India capital gains tax exemption benefit. But I think what is more important here is uh, the treatment of debt instruments, and uh, uh, there is a there is a huge benefit which has been given to debt investors under the protocol. And uh, maybe Mansi, it will be good to throw some light on uh, uh, how is the protocol going to help uh, the debt investments into India. Sure, Nisha. So, um, as far as investments in debt is concerned, until now, or until at least this protocol, uh, if you've noticed, Mauritius has mostly not been considered. And the reason being the way the treaty was worded uh, currently, it doesn't provide any benefit insofar as interest payments from India to Mauritius are concerned. So basically saying your exposure could go as much as 40%. So whenever there were debt investments involved, we were always looking for alternate jurisdictions. Now, in the past, Cyprus was extremely popular because it gave a preferential 10% rate. So if you notice, there was a time period where a lot of the funds were actually investing through or even being set up in Cyprus for real estate funds, etc. as they were using debt instruments and they were able to get this beneficial 10% uh, 
uh, rate as well as the capital gains exemption. Now, Cyprus, as Rajesh mentioned, has been blacklisted or notified as a non-cooperative jurisdiction. So that option currently is not available. Uh, of course, that has been challenged and we'll see how that unfolds. But leaving Cyprus aside, if you look at Singapore and Netherlands, the two other jurisdictions that Rajesh also mentioned, as far as interest is concerned, it is 10 and 15 percent withholding in these two jurisdictions. Netherlands has 10 and Singapore has 15. Now, Mauritius, in negotiating a 7.5%, has actually sort of prevailed over all of these jurisdictions insofar as debt is concerned. It is uh, probably the lowest rate that you'll get, and at the same, and that clubbed with the capital gains benefit, which of course not for shares, but for other securities may be available, because if you see the protocol, at least, it is very clear that it talks about gains from alienation of shares being taxable in India. But rest of the other properties will be taxable where the transferer is located. So to the extent we are doing CCDs or NCDs or instruments like that and getting interest coupons, uh, you get a beneficial interest uh, withholding rate. And at the time of sale, you get the capital. You should get the capital gains benefit. Of course, one thing to keep in mind as far as convertible instruments are concerned, if you do and if it is converted into equity shares and that's post 2017. That will again be governed by the previous clause, which is that it will, it will be considered as alienation of shares if you transfer it after conversion. So that will become taxable in India. But other than that, uh, I think uh, Mr. Mauritius will be definitely looked at now for a debt, for debt investments. It will become extremely popular for that part. Sure. Thanks, thanks Mansi. Uh uh, I think the Richie, uh, you have been advising number of uh, offshore and domestic GPs for raising their uh, offshore and domestic funds. Uh, typically, a question comes up at the time of structuring whether f should we follow a co-investment model, a unified model, and uh, uh, just want to get your thoughts on does this protocol change anything as far as unified versus co-investment structure is concerned for the GPs? Sure, sure. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so, uh, when advising a particular GP or considering whether should we go for a unified structure where uh, to explain a unified would mean perhaps you are setting up a feeder vehicle for pooling commitments from your offshore investors LPs and you make investments in India using a master vehicle which is traditionally in the format of a AIF alternative investment fund which has a domestic fund manager pretty much acting as the GP. A lot of other nuances have come into play which uh, make a unified structure far more compelling today despite the protocol being the way it has been worded. Uh, some of the reasons being that concurrent with its theme of Make in India, the government has also promoted the theme of Manage in India. So uh, while you had the Reserve Bank of India come out with a new Schedule 11 to the inbound investment uh, regime which pretty much ensures that if a fund is, has been set up in India and it has been sponsored and managed by a domestic GP. Investments by that AIF would be at par with any other domestic investor, irrespective of the corpus which has been raised by foreign LPs. That pretty much makes a good case that in case the investment thesis that a fund is following is, is on those asset strategies which have FDI related restrictions. A unified structure is, is pretty much inevitable for them to <coughs> properly you know, explore the investment strategy. Uh, what has also happened is very recently the, the, the finance bill that came out has proposed and, and it is uh, you know uh, taking shape of the act now that in case of AIF structures there will be a look through to the treaty provisions of the investors. So this pretty much allows a domestic GP or a, if part of the GP team is based in India to raise commitments not only from the domestic investors but as well as a foreign investor base. Uh, what is also interesting is that uh, while the treaties have been you know, allowed on a look-through basis, you could also very creatively structure your multi-class uh, you know, formats in a fund in India. Uh, a particular class could be you know, sort of used to cater to domestic investors. Another class could be used to cater to offshore investors. Perhaps you could deliver a dollar IRR to your offshore investors. You could, you could structure your waterfall to match the economics that a foreign investor would expect perhaps out of an offshore feeder vehicle of sorts. But the other issue which is linked to this is that as soon as your investors come directly into a fund in India, they would have to obtain a PAN, permanent account number, and as well as file tax returns in India, 
something which not all institutional LP base would be comfortable with. Accordingly, you may consider setting up a feeder vehicle yet in addition to an onshore AIF. Now, what the protocol does is puts into perspective like which jurisdiction should we offer. Uh, unlike, you know, uh, had the question come up a week earlier that, you know, if I'm going to set up a unified structure as a fund manager, should I consider Singapore or should I consider Mauritius? Now, now Mauritius continues to remain uh, compelling jurisdiction to choose as long as the strategies revolve around, let's say, yield generating assets or, or uh, real estate funds or debt funds, etc. Uh, or, or perhaps if you are a private equity fund but some of the asset strategies could revolve around holding CCDs or, or instruments which are other than the nature of shares. In which case again you could be taken that perhaps the interest income being generated being taxed at 7.5% like what the protocol which was released few hours back suggests. As well as when you are uh, you know exiting your positions either through a transfer or a, or a redemption in case of uh, uh, you know if you have used a unified structure. Uh, where uh, redeemable instruments are also a possibility. In that case, perhaps you could fall within the residual clause uh, of the protocol and accordingly perhaps be taxed in Mauritius and not in India. So, so there are a lot of interesting themes which one could consider. Like uh, Rajesh also indicated, Netherlands is also a compelling jurisdiction to look at today. Uh, especially if the theme is clearly around uh, you know equity uh, linked instruments. Uh, another option which one could explore is perhaps a two-tier structure in Mauritius where uh, because again of the residuary clause if the assets being transferred are other than shares of an Indian company which in this case could be the shares of a SPV uh, perhaps in Mauritius or in any other jurisdiction in that case also there, there could be an argument that the tax is in hands of Mauritius and not in India. So, so those are the themes which I see you know sort of uh, interplaying today uh, when considering between the two options. But, but I would definitely like to conclude by saying that you know it is it is slightly more severe uh, issue to grapple with, especially for those fund managers who already have a structure in place. There, pretty much we see fund managers in India in three different buckets. One could be those funds which are post their commitment period. They pretty much have already made all the investments they had to. Perhaps all future drawdowns are towards uh, you know operating expenses or follow on funding into existing portfolio companies. For them to not look at Mauritius continuing forward but look at another jurisdiction could be very difficult because they have to in turn respond to the LP base and explain to them why a shift in the structure is uh, uh, merits uh, further discussion. The second bucket which is, which is where the issue really plays a key role is those which are in the commitment period. Pretty much the fund has been set up, some investments have been done but going forward I am also looking at deploying further parts of my dry powder, the corpus which is yet undeployed. In those cases, we may have to sort of consider whether going forward Mauritius continues to be a good case. Should I consider an SPV in a different jurisdiction? Of course, depending on my ability to demonstrate substance in that other jurisdiction or in that SPV. So this is where we see a lot of you know structural aspects come into play. The third and of course slightly easier bucket to deal with is those fund managers who are yet in the market, marketing their fund, who are yet to achieve a first closing. In those cases, clearly they will have to bring in a new theme in their discussions with the investors that okay the treaty that we have always been relying on for so many years for my past series of funds past vintages etc all the dominant GPs in India today are, have been using Mauritius and Singapore we as a new GP or who are trying to close a new fund however are compelled to look at in other directions etc so which is where again I see some new themes sort of emerging sure so I think one thing which is clearly emerging from the discussions is uh, going forward Mauritius is going to pip Singapore, Netherlands and Cyprus as far as debt investments into India is concerned. And the reason is not only the reduced 7.5% interest withholding tax rate but also the fact that the local tax rate in Mauritius for offshore income is 3%. So even this 3% is not required, will not be required to be paid because you will get the uh, credit for the seven and a half percent which is uh, withheld in India and as we all know Mauritius uh, when it remits uh, income in the form of dividend or interest or royalty to non-resident of Mauritius there is no withholding tax in Mauritius. So pretty much for debt investment Mauritius will be a zero tax jurisdiction just like it has been for equity investments and uh, uh, clearly Mauritius is going to be looked at as a debt jurisdiction in its new avatar. Uh, versus uh, an equity jurisdiction which it has been for the last 30 to 33 years. But coming back to the question Rajesh, uh, we talked about the equity investments and uh, the fact that 
capital gains tax exemption benefits have been taken away for shares. Is this the end of Mauritius as far as equity investments is concerned? Or are there structures which still work for equity investments? So, so I think, uh, and when I started off by saying, I think <coughs> we have new structures emerging. I think one, a couple of things which I think will end up happening is that even when you look at private equity investors, the way they, that they sort of approach it, uh, over the, if you look at it historically in the last few years, you've had quite a few uh, structures which are essentially a, a double tier structure, uh, whether a double tier uh, Mauritius structure or double tier Singapore structure, uh, which have also been set up where uh, you have a holding company in Mauritius which has multiple SPVs and each SPV holds a single asset in India. Um, and today if you look at it, um, uh, if you have a situation where the holding company sells the Mauritius SPV. Uh, under the residuary article in the uh, revised protocol, the right to tax still vests with, um, vests, vests with Mauritius. So even though India has introduced uh, provisions relating to uh, uh, indirect transfer, uh, where you uh, sell shares of a foreign company whose uh, value is substantially derived from Indian assets, the uh, India would uh, still tax the transaction. But uh, when you start looking at treaties and uh, uh, most uh, treaties which India has negotiated, the right to tax as far as residuary uh, uh, provisions, which is what indirect transfers traditionally come into, vests with the country of residence. And that's the same case which is there in Mauritius Treaty. So I would still tend to think that you're going to have structures where uh, uh, there is going to be uh, a dual uh, tiered structure where there is still going to be a transfer that's going to happen. Uh, of course, in all of this, we should not forget the fact that uh, that India is introducing the general anti-abuse rules from 1st of April 2017. So any of these structures will obviously have to come along with it uh, or demonstrate enough commercial substance. Uh, as to why such structures have been set up in order to claim uh, the benefits. I think the second uh, aspect that, that is also interesting and, and that's a theme which we have seen in the last 2-3 years and I think it's going to just increase is that companies which have operations in multiple jurisdictions and I'm talking about here about the portfolio companies or the investee companies increasingly have been looking at re-domiciling themselves out of India and, and have a sort of a holding company outside of India where the Indian entity effectively either acts as the back office or one of the various uh, entities in the group. And uh, the private equity or uh, third party investors effectively come into the holding company which is situated outside of India. That's something, uh, it's effectively we've seen companies do corporate inversions uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, few years. Uh, at some point it was mostly because uh, they were worried about some of the uh, historical uh, tax issues uh, in India. But nowadays it's driven more from uh, where is the, the client market, where is the customer market uh, uh, which is located, where do I want to keep my management team. And those factors have been driving people to sort of set up their holding companies outside of India. I think that theme is going to continue now. Uh, in fact, I'm, we'll end up seeing increasingly a larger number of deals where the holding company is going to be situated outside of India. The private equity investors are going to be coming into the holding company outside of India. Uh, and again, I should caution that most of the cases that we've been seeing where these kind of structures have been adopted have been where the it's a business driven decision as much as probably a tax decision where your clients are sitting outside of india your markets are not necessarily only in india uh, where it makes a lot of sense for uh, for the companies also then to uh, to sort of invert themselves i think that's the other theme which i think uh, is going to continue the third theme of course is that even as far as direct investments i think you're going to have a trend uh, moving towards people wanting to invest in compulsorily convertible debentures uh, i think that is going to be driven more by what is the kind of exit that you're looking at uh, if your exit is going to be let's say uh, a private exit uh, yeah compulsorily convertible debentures still sort of work because uh, you can still sell the ccds still get the treaty benefits uh, and it should not be a problem uh, however, um, if you're looking at, uh, let's say, uh, uh, similarly, if you're looking at an IPO driven uh, uh, investment theme, there also you're fine because when you're doing it as part of a OFS, there is still no tax consequence uh, because of the way uh, the Indian domestic laws work. So, so I think 
the way uh, investors are going to be looking at uh, your you have to be focused a lot more around what is the real exit that you're going to see in a particular investment uh, what is the kind what is the real what is really the deal and, and as i said each class of investors will have slightly different structures now it's no longer going to be it doesn't matter what i'm doing i'll just come through mauritius or singapore <coughs> if if you're a private equity player you look at how your exit is probably going to pan out and then you take a call if you're a, a let's say somebody who's doing mez uh, even for them mauritius probably earlier which was an attractive has become a lot more attractive uh, uh, now a good uh, example will be all the fiis uh, who have come in and invested by way of ncd where they get a coupon plus uh, redemption premium uh, which is a back ended redemption premium those those structures will now sort of move into to mauritius fis as i said will again sort of uh, uh, flip between jurisdictions depending on their strategy so i think that now becomes a lot more relevant in terms of how people are going to be looking at structures sure so uh, we have discussed about uh, the direct and indirect investment from mauritius and singapore for private equity and uh, strategic investors uh but one section which is very important for the indian stock market says how are the foreign portfolio investors getting impacted through this and more than that the p note holders uh richie uh, would you like to share your thoughts on uh, how does the protocol impact especially the p note holders and the fpis sure sure so uh, p note as has traditionally been sort of uh, you know seen and constructed over global markets in india also the the plays between standard isra contract notes or perhaps warrants if they are mirroring uh, trs uh, total return swaps in a particular manner uh, so un un unless there is a, you know a, a probe into who the beneficial owners are which was very recently done by the swiss supreme court uh, you know in in case of a trs which was issued that uh, whether uh, whether the issuer has sort of you know passed on the economic as well as voting rights to the to the note holder and accordingly the beneficial owner has sort of uh, in a way passed to the you know the the p note holder to that extent unless those circumstances exist a uh, prima facie view is that a p note is a contractual arrangement where there is a exchange of cash flows sure. depending on how the underlying asset uh, classes are performing etc to that extent p note holding per se is not a taxable uh, you know event uh, from an india perspective what is taxable however is the hedge component which an fii issuer would have been maintaining to support the p notes that have been issued it is in this context that the change in protocol obviously has a significant bearing uh, what was previously an absolutely tax exempt situation for the hedge holder hedge position holder has now become a situation where unless they are holding a underlying investment for more than 12 months because of the change introduced by the protocol in case of short term positions like if let's say the notes were redeemed or wound up by the p note holder and there is a matching winding up of the position by the fii which has issued the p note in those cases we may see a, a sort of passing up of the short term capital gains or the gain attribution the tax attribution by the fii to the or the fpi in the, in the current scenario to the p note holder so so pretty much what we have seen is most of the global institutions who have been acting as the counterparties the swap dealers they have been uh, sort of hedging the positions using traditionally mauritius or singapore based structures perhaps we could see a, a change of uh, or a, a, the redomiciliation of the of the arm which is issuing the uh, the hedge uh, that could perhaps look at netherlands because of uh, you know factors which yet still make uh, and keep netherlands a very compelling jurisdiction uh to make equity investments in india we could also see a, a, a new industry sort of grooming out of sweden uh which also has similar uh, relaxations as far as capital gains is concerned uh what what previously erstwhile uh, mauritius used to sort of uh, enjoy so so there are definitely quite a few shifts in how the industry is structured today but but given that these are very issuer specific you know uh, uh, reasons to move from one jurisdiction to another we would definitely see a shift to begin with we will also see a situation where some of the issuers who are out of mauritius or singapore setups may perhaps passing on on a matching basis the tax bill that they would be receiving in turn uh, versus other issuers who are perhaps out of netherlands or sweden who may not have any tax impact to their hedge positions and accordingly may not pass on the tax cost to the p note holders so clearly it's a very interesting uh, 
times for both the holders as well as the issuers of P notes. Yeah. Sure. And I think the, uh, the other thing is that, and, and again, here there's no one size fits all uh, as far as the issuers are concerned. Because there are some issuers who are there on the street who have losses sitting on their books, they file their tax returns, they have their short term capital losses. So, so I think come 1st April 2017, even if the benefit sort of falls off. Uh, you're going to have different strategies which are going to be adopted by different uh, issuers and it's going to be more issuer specific uh, more than uh, having one industry standard across the board mm. and I think that's going to be uh, at least that's going to be changing the dynamics when it comes to uh, ODI or P note issuance. Sure. Uh, so before we take questions Rajesh <coughs> would you like to uh, would you like to talk about any other critical issue which uh, which we have not discussed uh, you know, and which is part of the protocol. So, so I think the one other thing apart from all of these discussions that we've had is is really the change which they brought about to the other income provision under mm -hmm. the uh, revised protocol. Traditionally, Mauritius was one of the few countries where under the treaty, the right to tax uh, other income was actually with the country of residence and not the country of uh, source. So, so in case of uh, and more specifically, especially in a private e equity context, you're talking about um, uh, Section 56 of the Income Tax Act, which essentially talks about situations where a recipient um, uh, of shares or an investor has received shares at less than fair market uh, value. In that case, the recipient of shares is taxed on the spread between um, the fair market value and the per and the acquisition price of the shares. So I think um, uh, this was one, uh, at least for investors who are coming in from Mauritius, traditionally this was never an issue. Uh, and we've seen this quite a bit, uh, uh, especially for somebody like a, a foreign venture capital investor who's got a FECI registration, who are not really bound by pricing guidelines. We've seen as part of restructurings or, or swaps, where they've actually gotten shares at uh, less than fair market value. But but uh, uh, since at, at least till uh, uh, the protocol came in, that was less of an issue, uh, especially when you're looking at restructurings uh, and for FECIs. I think now, since uh, India has essentially said that the right to tax other income now comes back to India, mm. I think that's another point which uh, I think investors will need to be uh, aware of. Uh, even when they are looking at any kind of structuring or restructuring. Sure, and I, I think this becomes important because, uh, uh, as all of you are aware, uh, uh, foreign venture capital investors are allowed to transact, uh, f uh, you know, without any pricing restrictions in India. So there are no entry and exit pricing restrictions. And uh, frequently, we have been involved in restructurings where FACIs uh, are either tra transferring or purchasing shares from the promoters at a very low value. Uh, in those situations, till date, the Mauritius Treaty benefits have always been taken uh, in spite of the fact that uh, those transactions happen at less than fair value or book value. Uh, but with the new change, uh, India will also have a right to tax such Mauritius FECIs or foreign venture capital investors if they are transacting at below the book value in case of restructurings. I think the other important point which uh, uh, has been missed by many in the protocol is that any shares which are acquired post 1st April 2017 are going to be subject to capital gains tax. Uh, people have always thought that all investments made prior to 2017 April 1st are grandfathered but actually the language is only shares and it does not talk about investments which means that if any foreign investor or a Mauritius investor has invested in the Indian company through compulsorily convertible preference share or compulsorily convertible debenture and that investment has been made prior to 1st of April 2017 but the conversion into equity shares happens post 1st April 2017 then the grandfathering benefit will not be available and this is something which becomes very important because it's very uh, standard for private equity investors to take a nominal, uh, uh, you know, equity shares and invest substantial portion of their investment in the form of uh, convertible instruments, uh, especially to achieve uh, anti-dilution and liquidation preference uh, benefit, uh, which which are typically available to private equity investors. Now, the moment they convert their shares after first April 2017. Uh, when they sell these equity shares at a later date, it will get captured under the protocol and uh, there will be capital gains tax which will be required to be payable. And on top of that, as we know, uh, in India, 
before uh, before the company goes for listing the convertible securities need to be mandatorily converted into equity so even in situation where contractually the private equity investor does not want to convert the convertibles into equity but the law forces them to convert this might be another situation where uh, uh, you know uh, there could be potential tax issue for these investors in a situation where the ipo doesn't happen after the conversion so uh, there are uh, uh, issues uh, you know uh, like this which uh, needs to be thought through properly before uh, a decision is taken on conversion so with this uh, we'll open the floor for questions from the participants thank you very much sir Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on your touchtone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to only use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who has a question at this time may press star and one on your phone. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have the first question from the line of Abrita B from CCRT. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I'm sorry, ma'am. We are not able to hear you clearly. Hello, is this better? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask whether the grandfathering would cover the total amount invested before April 2017, or whether it covers only the specific security. So, in other words, if uh, you know we were to sell a security after April 2017 and uh, buy another one, would the new investment uh, be subject to the lower tax rate so, uh, just so because the money had come prior to April 2017? Uh, the the it only covers the specific securities, not the investment amount. So, so which takes me back to Nishchal's uh, Nishchal's point, which which means that even if you have converted your shares post uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, converted your convertibles post uh, 1st April 2017, even that is not captured within the grandfathering provision. So, so to that extent, it's a very absolute rule saying that if I hold shares today, as long as I sell it uh, post uh, 1st April 2017, I'll get the benefit. If merely acquiring new shares with that money, converting, uh, let's say, debentures into shares post 1st April, none of those will get the benefit. So the trigger point okay. is uh, uh, acquisition of shares and not the date of investment. Okay, and uh, just to you know, uh, clarify once again, uh, this uh, clauses apply only to the shares, right? Uh, That's correct. And that is not correct. To the bond investment. That, that is, is correct. correct. Okay. So as far as interest earned by FPIs and uh, the capital gains of FPIs uh, on bond investments are concerned. Uh, what has changed? So, so earlier, if you look at it, the Mauritius Treaty never had uh, a favorable provision as far as uh, uh, debt investments are concerned. So, as, as okay. FPIs, you are generally going under the domestic law provisions uh, on uh, uh, interest okay. coupon. Uh, you did have the favorable provision of 5% uh, rate under domestic law uh, under certain okay. circumstances depending on the, uh, on the coupon rate. Uh, which was actually okay. being uh, given. So, but now what the uh, 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 treaty essentially says is that it gives you a, a standard flat 7.5% rate, uh, which which unless you're going under the 5% rate under the domestic law, which happens only if you're within the prescribed limit on coupon rate, uh, you mm -hmm. would have otherwise been taxed at a higher rate of uh, of uh, 20% or so. So, so to that extent, that's where you are actually getting uh, a favorable benefit. Uh, when you are doing any kind of structured NCD deal uh, or a bond deal where you are getting coupon flow. So, so that is on the interest portion as far as capital gains on transfer of bonds is concerned nothing has changed in the treaty. So it is okay. still not taxable. It is still not taxable. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Next question is on the line of Roger Blue from Lawrence and Luke. Please go ahead. Yeah, good day uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Nishit Desai uh, for, for organizing this. Uh, quite helpful and 
I would just like to, to make an observation and pose a question. I'm, I'm myself a, a Dutch tax lawyer and, uh, well, from a commercial perspective, you'll see uh, the opportunities we, uh, we, see, we see here. I was just wondering, in, in your view, I mean, the Netherlands itself, as, as you stated earlier, has always been interesting from a debt point of view. Of course, uh, if you are able to build the substance, uh, especially uh, now that GAR will actually be coming in next year. Um, now it seems that from an equity perspective, uh, uh, definitely um, terrain has been won. Um, uh, Mauritius, on paper, of course, is now uh, very favorable if you look at, um, at debt investments. Um, but if we tie this all to, to uh, G20, OECD, BEPS, Action 6, uh, Panama Papers, uh, and what have you, uh, there is, of course, a whole onshore movement. I think Mauritius today is still seen as an offshore center. Um, do you see, um, going forward, so let's say in the years to come, a lot of investors still go through Mauritius just to take... Uh, to utilize this lower rate, or do you think uh, people will, you know, count their blessings and maybe think, well, the Netherlands, an onshore jurisdiction, not a bad place to live, let's build some substance there, good capital gains protection, and debt investments, 10% uh, not that bad. Uh, what, what is your view if you take that political, um, you know, movement into account? Um. Roger, thanks for joining in. Uh, I think what you're probably going to see is is that Netherlands is, you're going to see a lot more inflow coming in from Netherlands. I don't think there's any two ways about it. Uh, purely because even if you look at some of the, the larger private equity players in the market, a lot of them do actually have some kind of presence uh, uh, and they have used Netherlands in the past even for uh, European investment. So, so, so for a lot of people, wherever it's easier for them to, to build up uh, substance uh, they would want to gravitate towards uh, Netherlands uh, and, and as you said because when you start looking at things holistically saying that well I get gains I get uh, a, a decent benefit as far as capital gains is concerned I'm not too worse off as far as uh, debt investments are concerned uh, and therefore why don't I move in towards uh, uh, Netherlands I think you're going to have a, a large f uh, set of people going going in there Having said that, I don't uh, necessarily think that Mo uh, Mauritius will go completely or uh, uh, will become completely redundant. Uh, uh, I think you're still going to have uh, 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 at least on some portion of debt investments uh, going to be coming in through Mauritius. It's th uh, something that was traditionally not happening at all. Um, uh, I think if you think about it uh, to a certain extent, the biggest loser seems to have been Singapore in all of this. Uh, because what will happen effectively to my mind is that people will actually prefer sort of going in uh, uh, saying that, well, for debt, I rather look at uh, a Netherlands or a Mauritius and for capital gains, well, I'll obviously go towards Netherlands. I think so. I think that's how it's probably going to pan out. Where uh, uh, in all of this, while we've been talking about this, uh, I think the biggest beneficiary is obviously going to be Netherlands. Uh, uh, and Mauritius is going to get, let's say, a new class of investors, uh, which were uh, earlier not there on the table. And Singapore is probably going to lose out on both. Yeah, and uh, just to add to what Rajesh said, I think it's also important to consider the non-tax implications of using Mauritius versus Singapore versus Netherlands. Uh, Mauritius, uh, uh, with its, uh, in addition to the fantastic tax treaty that it always had with India, has also been one of the most preferred jurisdiction for setting up of funds because of its corporate laws. Uh, the corporate laws are extremely flexible in Mauritius. Uh, redemption uh, by the funds to the LPs is allowed to the extent of 100% without any issue. So some of those things will also play a role in determining the jurisdiction. Uh, because uh, sometimes uh, you know tax uh, may not be the only driver for choosing a jurisdiction and on top of that you know with GAR coming in as you rightly mentioned it will also be important to justify the substance in that jurisdiction and uh, so it will actually vary from uh, uh, client to client on whether Mauritius is better or Netherlands is better in addition to the tax changes which we just discussed. Thank you for your comments. Thank you.
The next question is from the line of Alok Mehta from Constellation Blue. Please come ahead. Yeah, hi, good morning and many thanks for this wonderful opportunity. Now the press release is talking about the capital gains which arise on transfer of shares which are held in a company which is resident in India. But the, would this also include investments into units of AIF under unified structure? Um, it will not include because what happens is that as far as I'm talking only about transfer of units in an AIF. Right. That gets right. covered within the residuary provision of the treaty. And the way the okay. so so the way the tree the revised protocol sort of works and the way the treaty works is that if you're selling shares of a company and it's restricted only to shares, in that case the right to tax comes back to India. But in terms mm -hmm. of any gains which arise from alienation of any other property, and when you talk right. about any other property here, it's a property not being shares property not be, being a movable property forming part of a permanent establishment or ships and aircraft or immovable property. All of those situations, the right to tax still con continues to be with Mauritius, which means units of a AIF, units uh, in case of uh, Security, ARC, yeah. securitization trusts, uh, uh, LLP uh, interest, all of them, the right to tax still rests with Mauritius and not with India. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Parikshit Sharma from Morgan Lewis. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful and very informative talk. Uh, I, I have a, actually a small concern. I, I understand from the talk that uh, uh, there is some discussion about renegotiation of the uh, India-Singapore Treaty. Now, uh, the, the question I have is this, that before the treaty is renegotiated and assuming in, for, for the next couple of weeks there is no grandfathering for the, for the Singapore Treaty, do you see any possibility of uh, the Indian tax authority trying to tax an exit uh, from, from a Singapore perspective happening before 1st April 2017? In other words, if I sell my shares tomorrow, do you see that Indian tax authority is trying to tax us? So, so Parikshit, the way the, the Singapore protocol works, right? It says that the provision relating to capital gains tax will only fall away when the Mauritius, when the source, uh, when the under the Mauritius Treaty, there is a source-based taxation which comes into effect. Under the protocol that India has negotiated with Mauritius, the source-based taxation comes into effect from first of April two thousand and seventeen. So from for any exit which which let's say a singapore company makes till 31st march 2017 mm -hmm. i don't see a problem the the singapore treaty still continues obviously subject to meeting the lob requirements under the singapore treaty you will still get the benefit of capital gains but be between now and uh, 31st march the expectation is that the government is going to renegotiate the treaty just to ensure that for exits which are happening from 1st of April onwards 2017 there is a grandfathering that comes into play on the Singapore side also yeah and it will be interesting to see in this uh, Singapore treaty which is renegotiated would Singapore also ask for a seven and a half percent lower withholding tax rate for interest so that could also be a trade-off yeah, for them to yeah. give up the capital gains article yeah. Okay, uh, just, just, just one more question. Uh, do, 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 you, do you have any, any visibility on the timeline when you see this renegotiation happening? I, I expect it to happen fairly quickly. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, the India-Singapore, the, the protocol itself provides for an intergovernmental meet on a yearly basis. I don't expect uh, the government also to, to sort of keep investors hanging uh, with, with uh, any kind of uh, too much of grey area as far as Singapore is concerned because historically e even if you think about it uh, the the benefits under the Singapore Treaty came in back in 2004-05 uh, when the CECA was being negotiated so I expect both the Indian government and the Singapore government to move fairly quickly uh, to just in order to ensure that uh, there is no uh, not, not too much of grey areas where uh, investors are left uh, sort of hanging in balance thank you so much Thank you. The next question is from the line of A. Johan from Jurist Consult. Please go ahead. Hi there. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, before asking my question, I just wanted to make a general 
um, comment. Uh, from the um, Mauritius perspective, I think it's fair to say that the media coverage yesterday was largely negative and the picture of doom and gloom was being um, painted. I think now that we've seen the actual text of the protocol, um, perhaps things are not as bad as we originally thought. Um, I had to, my question was on the GAR. In your view, is it clear that the GAR will not apply for those investments that have been grandfathered? So, so I wouldn't expect the government to take any moves where they where they try and impose guard as far as uh, investments which have been grandfathered. Uh, you, we have to sort of keep it in perspective here. I, and and for me, I look at this more as a as literally a policy decision which the government has been taking more than anything else. Because if I look at the technical provisions where uh, under the Income Tax Act in India. You do have a provision which says that uh, the general anti-avoidance rules will override uh, any provisions of the tax treaties that India has entered into. But I think, um, I don't expect the Indian government to go in and try and apply guard uh, after having gone in and made a statement that we are going to, we are going to be grandfathering uh, yeah, past investments which have been made till 31st March uh, 2017 because I think to a certain extent I think the government has gone in on record to say that listen one of the reasons why Mauritius was pragmatic enough to accept the change to the treaty benefit was the fact that they knew GAR was coming into place from 1st of April and that was actually one of the negotiating tools which India used to do it. For the Indian government to then go back and uh, take a stance that uh, for past investments also we are going to apply GAR, I would be very, very surprised uh, to see something along those lines. Uh, uh, at least I have not, uh, and I think as a policy decision, India will desist from doing that. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Akansha Sharma from Ivy Cap Ventures. Please go ahead. Hi, I want to thank you first of all for holding this very useful session. Uh, I have a clarification uh, and then I'll quickly move on to the question. The clarification was so essentially what we're saying is in case of an AIF, which is a unified structure with a feeder vehicle in Mauritius, uh, it doesn't matter when the money comes in uh, from the Mauritius investors. What What is important is for that timeline to uh, be effective that uh, the sale of shares has to happen before 1st April 2017, right? Only then we can take the advantage under the protocol. That is correct. So this okay. essentially, uh, what we the point here was that you know units of an AIF could would fall within uh, the residuary provisions, but what it also means is we are then talking about a LP secondary situation where LPs are let's say transferring units, and then the one which is exiting is uh, transferring units it was holding in an AIF to another investor perhaps, uh, whereas mm -hmm. you know uh, traditionally AIFs have always been taxed on a look through basis. So as in when the portfolio company is making distributions, that is when you look at uh, where the the treaty points to as far as a, a beneficiary is concerned. Understood. So now the question was, so, so what happens to say an investor who has come to a bigger legal right? So uh, he will be chargeable for capital gains uh, in India, but then can he claim uh, credit for the same in his own jurisdiction or then uh, in that case we have to look at specific treaties for that? Um, it, it it would be a function of both the specific treaties and the the law and the domestic jurisdiction, as far as uh, the the investors are concerned. Uh, so so usually treaties do sometimes pro uh, automatically provide for a credit. Uh, yeah, and uh, otherwise even otherwise even for example in India you have uh, provisions which talk about. Uh, uh, treaty via or credit uh, benefits flowing through and most other jurisdictions also have similar provisions in place. Alright, thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Arvind Halkari of Zeros Consults. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, uh, do you think that uh, Mauritius will be at a disadvantage because uh, in the absence of a most favoured nation clause? If ever India negotiates better treaties with other countries, so so I I my understanding is that I think India has stopped uh, giving out MFN uh, uh, provi uh, uh, provisions to to other countries. Uh, uh, so so uh, do I? Th I don't necessarily think that uh, uh, not having a, a MFN is necessarily bad, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I think. Uh, I don't see a situation where India is ever going to negotiate 
uh, a situation where they are going to give the taxing rights as far as capital gains back to uh, to the country of residence because uh, india has actively been looking at going the other way where they're saying that the source country should have the right to tax capital gains uh, and similarly i don't see india negotiating a lower rate for example on most of the uh, the uh, uh, other articles uh, lesser than the rate that they have negotiated so i don't necessarily think it's going to be uh, too bad in terms of not having uh, uh, mfn yeah, the uh, MFN is something which I look at as uh, a good to have, but having said that, I don't think the treaty which India negotiated is so bad uh, with Mauritius that that uh, the, that uh, that they're going to have uh, better treaties around. Huh. Huh. Though, though the one thing I should add is that uh, the Dutch treaty, of course, has a MFN provision. Though I do want to go back and check whether now the Netherlands will also enjoy a 7.5 percent rate. But otherwise, I don't really uh, think uh, uh, not having a MFN is too bad a situation. Yeah. So this also goes back to Roger's question on uh, the feasibility of Netherlands uh, on for the debt investment. So. If the MFN clause, which is there under the Dutch India tax treaty, also covers the uh, interest article, then in that situation, by virtue of Mauritius getting 7.5% rate, automatically Netherlands could also get that 7.5% withholding tax rate versus the 10% which is currently there under the treaty. But that's something we'll have to check on uh, whether it applies to the interest article also. Okay. Mr. Halkari, do you have any more questions? Our next question is from the line of Fico Shu of uh, TSE. Please go ahead. Hi, um, my question is for the, for the main purpose and a bona fide business test that applies during the trans transitional period. Does it, um, does it, uh, is it measured by, by the SPV that hold the, uh, the Indian company shares, or it can be measured against the, the whole investor group. So, yeah. so I mean, mm -hmm. so. so so technically, if you look at it, you are supposed to be looking at uh, the SPV only because the way the LOB works is that uh, 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 it, where the affairs of the SPV arranged with the primary purpose to take advantage of the benefits of the capital gains tax provision. Mm -hmm. Having said that, it also you would want to then also say that, well, if there is a commercial rationale as to why the SPV was set up, uh, which were non-tax or uh, uh, other commercial purpose. I think that all of that goes towards uh, uh, establishing uh, the, uh, the primary purpose. And I'll give you a simple example. Let's say I have a group presence in a particular country where I have, uh, and, and that's an argument that we've used in the past, saying that as a group I have extensive presence in a country, therefore I prefer having a uh, uh, SPV set up in a particular country. So, so while you still primarily look at the SPV, to determine whether the main purpose is met but even while you're looking at it you can try and rely on uh, the group's presence possibly in the country also as ancillary reasons uh, when you're talking about the main purpose test okay thank you thank you thank you very much yeah, actually, another question. I just wanted to comment on what you were just discussing. I was looking at the treaty uh, between India and the Netherlands, and it does have a most favored nations clause, but it only refers to beneficial rates concluded with uh, OECD countries. Um, I'm, I'm guessing Mauritius is not one of them. Uh, Roger, I think you're right on that. I don't think Mauritius is an OECD country. Yeah, so, so I think to that extent, yeah, you're right, the MFN will not apply. Correct. So then Mauritius is still better than Netherlands to that extent, as far as debt investments is concerned. Again, thank you very much. I will jump out now. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. Our next question is from the line of uh, Hag Gohan of uh, Zurich Consult. Please go ahead. Um, hi there. Um, so I had another follow-up question. I 
I guess the answer would probably be similar to your answer on Gopa, but to the extent that India um, negotiates um, the multilateral um, and signs up to the multilateral instrument and the action point 15 um, for BEPS, I would have thought um, your same analysis would would apply in relation to, to grandfathered um, investments. So say, for example, there's an LOB clause or a PPP clause presumably this grandfathered investment would still be protected? Uh, that, that, that would be right because as I said and, and which is why I step back to say mm -hmm. that I think it's a policy decision that's been taken uh, very unlikely for India then to take a different call uh, even if it signs up the, the multilateral instrument. Uh, I, I, and again you have to step back and see that uh, over the last two, two and a half years I think the government has been uh, saying that we will ensure that there is stability, we will ensure that anything that we do is only prospective uh, and not uh, uh, looking backwards. So I, I think uh, uh, you will have to look at it in light of the overarching policy. So I don't think uh, it's going to have an impact. Okay, so uh, we can uh, take one more question before we close this webinar. Um, so there are no further questions from the participants. So okay. Would you like to add a few closing comments? Sure. Uh, so uh, I think as I mentioned, this is a historic development uh, as far as taxation in India is concerned. Uh, and uh, it will be interesting to see the negotiations which go on between India and Singapore, especially on the interest article, uh, given the fact that Singapore and Netherlands, which have been favored for uh, making debt investments into India, uh, Mauritius will be a very strong competitor to uh, get those investments uh, from Singapore and Mauritius. Uh, as as we say, time will tell uh, which jurisdiction wins uh, as far as the debt investments in India is concerned. Uh, with this, uh, we'll close the webinar and uh, thanks to all the participants for joining this uh, webinar. Thank you and have a good day.